Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family, where members of the Catholic Medical Association explore medical topics vital to the health of you and your family members. I'm Dr. Tom McGovern, the host of Vital Signs, brought to you by Shalom World TV. Today, we examine the widespread problem of anxiety in children. While all children experience the emotion of anxiety, some of them respond to it with worry, dread, and rumination that cause intense suffering that prevents them from living the joyful lives God intends them to live. Some children experience anxiety in social situations. Others worry frequently about bad things that might happen in the future. And still others have extreme fears about specific things, like spiders, or situations, like going to the dentist. By the age of 13, nearly one in three children have had, or still have, a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And in a quarter of those, or about 1 in 12 children, anxiety severely impacts their everyday lives and significantly limits their ability to succeed in school, thrive at home, or enjoy playing with other children. The lifetime experience of suffering with anxiety is almost 50% more common in girls than in boys. And at any given point in time, about 1 in 14 children suffer from an anxiety disorder. But in the age group of 12 and over, that increases to one in 10 children. Yet, as we will learn, there are reliably effective ways to treat children suffering with anxiety. Joining us today is Dr. Larry Mittnall, a child psychiatrist practicing at Ascension Health Via Christi Clinic in Wichita, Kansas, where he lives with his wife and five children. Larry, welcome to Vital Signs. Thank you for having me, what, a, what an honor. Larry, what is anxiety and how is it related to worry? Um, worry is a part of the human condition. It's something that we all um, have as part of our makeup, as part of the way that we experience the world. And, and sometimes that part of our brain that's responsible for helping us to detect um, danger or identify um, stress can feel overwhelming and be so so big um, that it causes people's lives to shrink a little bit. And so that's usually when we use the term anxiety or call it an anxiety disorder, meaning that the the little the the stress that should be a manageable bite-sized piece um, that help our bodies to signal something that we should respond to um, ends up being something that can really take over. So is anxiety another name for worry or are they two different things? Yeah, often in the clinic we use them synonymously um, to talk about, you know, to talk about worry and anxiety. Um, but you know, pretty um, diagnostically speaking, we use anxiety disorder to describe a worry that's so strong that it's starting to limit and impact someone's day um, in some pretty profound ways. So maybe in the ways that they are, you know, interacting with family or the things that they avoid to do, maybe things that they previously um, enjoyed. And so when it's starting to have that level of of, of impact, it kind of raises to the level of anxiety, but really in common speech, we often use them to identify the same things. Just clinically, it's important for us to distinguish, is this a uh, disorder, meaning, you know, is the anxiety so intense that it's causing um, a child or an adult to um, not be able to kind of fulfill and execute um, in the world in the way that they would like? So how does anxiety present in a young child, say under 10 years of age? Sure. Um, 
and it can have you know varied um, varied presentations. And I'll give you some some just really common um, examples. So it, for viewers who might be not, not be familiar, imagine a kindergartner who's um, crying at school. Okay, and maybe that that little kindergartner is inconsolable about being separated from his or her mother. Now, despite everyone around him trying to you know console and comfort the child, um, the child can still express worry, and maybe that worry comes out also as um, worry about his mother and who he can't stop thinking about and wondering if she'll if she'll die if she's away from him. So um, so that's you know um, that's a, one of the ways in which um, anxiety can present in in really young kids, where you get a normal worry that's. Um, really kind of exaggerated or magnified um, to an extent that it's really impairing their day. Um, another example of maybe a, a young person under 10 would be, um, a, 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 you can imagine a, a, a young girl who um, has experienced some type of trauma. So perhaps um, her family's experienced a, you know, a fire where maybe they've lost some of their belongings, but they have managed to, you know, to survive and, and thrive. If this, if this same young girl, um, you know, three months later is having recurrent or repetitive um, nightmares about this past um, traumatic experience, that becomes, you know, an anxiety disorder that we're thinking about, you know, how do we help them to, to thrive and to manage those big emotions. And then if we move on to adolescents or teenagers, how might they present differently with anxiety than younger children? With the younger children, the examples that I gave you, you know, those are pretty concrete in that the kids can give examples. But often our young um, kiddos will say things like, you know, their tummy hurts or they're having a headache. Um, maybe their heart is beating kind of fast or their hands are feeling kind of shaky. And so we might be looking for other kind of medical, you know, causes or sleep habits or things that might be related to that. And so sometimes they don't really have the vocabulary to express the emotions that they're feeling inside. Teenagers, conversely, have a little bit more of that layer of, of complexity. And so sometimes they're able to, to say those things a little bit more to us um, and to let us know that they're really having a hard time and, and that might be the way that they express it. Also, there are certain types of anxiety. So the examples earlier with you know the child having significant separation anxiety, that's not something that typically mm -hmm. teenagers experience. They might be more you know prone to experience something Thing like um, some obsessional th thinking. So you can think of a child who, you know, maybe in the in the recess of his mind, what brother hasn't pushed your button enough to make you think, hey, I want to give him a good sock on the nose, right? But the child who has that thought and can't let go of that thought, it keeps repeating, repeating over and over, even when he's not attempting to think about it. So that's another way that, you know, an older child might be able to express I just have this this thought that keeps cycling over and over that is getting stuck in my brain and I'm looking for a way to to you know feel better. Larry, when kids experience these uncomfortable feelings of anxiety, what are some of the ineffective ways they try to cope with it? One of the biggest is to avoid um, because the the difficulty is that avoidance does bring relief, but only temporarily. Um, and it's not a, a long game. You know, we grow developmentally when we learn how to master the challenges and then incorporate that in our life to move on and forward. And so often um, kids will instead shrink from the opportunity to, um, to you know, speak in front of the class or to participate in the club or activity or, or, um, or go to the restaurant and pay for, you know, pay for the food. They'd rather, you know, uh, shift that to somebody else. So avoidance is number one. The other can be um, silence. So sometimes our kids may have the answers for us about what's what's distressing them, um, but they might feel like it's it's too big to to say, and that saying it brings about more um, distress. So those are probably the two most common strategies that are ineffective that I see um, kids engaging in. Those are great examples. And then on top of that, we have the emotional changes of growing older, including puberty. How does that make it even more challenging to identify and address anxiety disorders? Sure. Um, we know that you know the adolescent period is fraught with a lot of changes, just as you said, you know, both with um, body and and mind, but also in growing kind of independence and hopefully growing mastery. And so um, and so 
at, at these are can be vulnerable stages when um, kids are a little bit more aware, aware of peers and maybe how they fit or don't fit um, within whatever that you know culture or milieu is. And so um, and so we know that that for kids who already come into the world with a little bit more you know apprehension, um, that that fight or flight response is a little bit more um, highly tuned um, maybe than the than the average um, kiddo, that they can really have a hard time during this stage and and um, and when you think about you know all the many ways that that kids are kind of looking at themselves you know in the uh, in the mirror maybe kind of judging judging themselves or judging their their appearance um, it I related to one teenager uh, recently that you know even our email addresses have you know icons of ourselves <laughs> and so um, that we're looking at and it's not a deep reflection but it's another opportunity for us to kind of judge our appearance and our and the way we present ourselves and so all of these things can be um, you know crazy making for um, for our young people so crazy making that's a good uh, description so if a parent is faced with a child who is crazy making, how can they teach that child how to understand, allow, and address those painful emotions that they might experience every day? Sure. Um, one is um, being aware and just recognizing the pattern. So if we see our children getting into a pattern of, you know, every time it's it's time to go to school or to go to a particular practice, and suddenly there's the stomach aches, suddenly there's the headaches, helping them to identify and and uh, and have a vocabulary to describe. Maybe this isn't just a, a headache for a headache's sake, but uh, maybe this is my body or my brain relating some emotion um, to me as well. And I think often labeling and being able to name things helps our children to be able to conquer them um, a little bit more readily. The other is, um, I think, modeling for our kids. So it's not uncommon that we as parents also struggle, even if it's not to the same extent that our children do, with some of the things that they might be prone to. And so I think the times that we can talk about wow, that was really stressful. You know what helped me through. You know, I, I made time for um, for my meditation and prayer this morning, and that really made a, a difference. Or, you know, getting outside and doing some exercise. Um, and so, and, and then the third part, um, which sounds cliche and perhaps passe, is, is the dinner table and meal times together. I think there are some missed moments um, of talking about um, emotionally what's going on with our kids. And, and there's a a greater chance to catch what it is that they might be um, struggling with by what they describe and what they're saying to us. That's good practical advice. And we know that despite the COVID pandemic or that anxiety disorders have been increasing worldwide. What's behind that, Larry? Yeah, um, I think there are probably a couple of things at play um, too that are leading to some of that apprehension. And and the truth is, you know, we don't have um, uh, full knowledge yet. I think that's a that's a subject of ongoing study and inquiry too to to figure out some of those things. But at least some of the common themes that I see in the clinic, um, one is the isolation um, that I think we we know um, that we're built for community and that we're wired for um, for people and communities of love. And so that was one of the primary things that our kids have been um, struggling with throughout this year. And even though they've been able to re-engage in many parts of the country um, and maybe parts to the world to do that again, um, there really is something of a, of, a, of a deficit too, just in that time when they weren't able to connect. The other thing is, as much as we pay attention to the peer connections, um, there really is a strong forming element from having many adults in your life too, who are able to speak into um, helping you to feel more confident. So when the art teacher you know, tells you how well that you did or the wrestling coach um, you know, gives you high praise um, for what you're able to do. All those little pieces add up to people's, and, and especially our young people, their feeling of mastery and self-confidence. And so I think we're still catching up um, in a lot of those things that our children weren't engaged in that were bulwarks, that were helpful pillars for helping them to cope. But even before the pandemic, anxiety was increasing in children. What might be some of the other causes? Sure. Um, the other things that we know are also um, the uh, is attachment is the word I'm going to use for it. And part of it is um, our our tech saturated you know time. And of course, I I I am aware that I'm saying this as we're you know speaking um, and are blessed by the technology that's allowing us to connect. Um, but I think what we're recognizing and more parents are recognizing is that there's a superficial connection that comes from. Um, our digital connections, that it's not like the mighty oak, which is rooted in the ground and, and has extensive root systems that 
in the face of high winds and storming rains will withstand being shaken. Instead, you know, we see kids who are maybe more peer oriented. So if you take the TikToks, the Snapchats, the, you know, um, all of those things, um, you know, some kids, their, their, their sense of themselves are actually correlate with the number of likes that they get or the number of shares of the videos that they've, uh, that they've posted. And so I think we have, um, maybe unknowingly kind of turned our kids towards each other, which is wonderful in, in a limited sense, but really we want them oriented towards adults because adults help them set the future, help them to develop the skills that they'll need to kind of push um, push forward as well. And so I think um, the things that our kids have been attaching to as their primary um, supports have also um, made it harder to um, to recover during this uh, during this time. That's some great insight, Larry. Let's turn to treatment. It seems from what I've learned that the most effective and long lasting treatment for anxiety disorders teaches patients how to develop healthier thought patterns through what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. What would you like parents to know about that? The great thing is um, that, that cognitive behavioral therapy and the types of therapy we use for anxiety are really, really effective at helping our kids to do well. And so they often allow our children to be um, scientists in some ways so they can look at their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors, and how those things interact and can stop the behaviors that might push that cycle of thought that gets them in, in, in those stuck situations or stuck um, habits. And so, um, and so I think these are really mighty things. What's also remarkable is that when you look at the functional MRI studies, I mean, the changes in the brain that we see from kids who learn these skills are enduring. They, in many cases, um, or in some studies, they actually last longer um, than medication interventions too. And so um, these are really potent things that um, that I want parents to feel encouraged and empowered um, to take advantage of. That if your you know doctor or friend is recommending that you know your child might benefit from from these types of therapies, um, it's worth giving it um, a, a a look um, because it really can be impactful for children. And is cognitive behavioral therapy something that parents can start learning from a book, or do they need to see a counselor first? Sure. Um, there are some programs that allow um, families to, to do it, but typically um, it's administered by a counselor or someone trained in the, the model. So there are parts of cognitive behavioral therapy that you can learn from just reading, and I would encourage parents to, to read ab about it. Um, there are some programs like um, Coping Cat, which are made into kind of video game, choose your own adventure things that families and kids can do um, can do together. Um, but often that still is paired with someone in the real world who's also, you know, looking at the particular things that a child might be struggling with and helping them to to make the next, you know, best leap to help them to be stronger. And then what's the role of medication in treating children with anxiety? Uh, you know, medication can also be um, a helpful part of the of the treatment, um, and so. But I think the 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 first step often, especially in anxiety disorders, is really the therapy. I mean, the medication is certainly helpful, um, but as I often, you know, will will caution parents that there's no skills in the pill. So while it can help, you know, turn down some of that high level anxiety to help a child better engage in the therapy, better engage um, in their in their world, it isn't a substitute um, for the work that um, that they'll do paired one-on-one -on -one or families working together um, to figure out solutions to, um, to big worries that kids might be struggling with. But the good thing is the medications that we tend to use, if that's um, recommended or indicated for kids, are, are, really, are really pretty safe. Um, they've been out for a really long time. And so um, often with just kind of careful supervision, um, we can start them for kids. And our hope is this, is that often we use the medication kind of like a cast where you know the cast that you put on that that broken arm isn't the medicine per se it's the thing kind of holding the system together while allowing the the natural resources of the body to kind of heal itself and so often with kids our gold standard is you know if they require medication um, we might get them started on that while they're doing therapy and then if they've had a consistent you know year pretty much of of life being where it needs to be then we start kind of tapering back um, to allow their brain to show us, you know, how much it's it's learned and been able to incorporate over that year. One of the other treatments I've heard about for anxiety involves a certain amount of silence each day. What do you think about that? 
I think that's wonderful, um, and it's actually a, a, a premium. It's hard. Uh, it's harder and harder to come by, I think, in the lives of parents for sure, and also our our children. Um, that uh, they often jump from event to event, or screen to screen, or you know, sport to to hobby. And it turns out that um, that there's a lot that we can do by just. Um, by you know breathing and being connected um, with um, with in, in both in in prayer and just being mindful of our surroundings and our bodies. You know one of the things that uh, that I think the technology sometimes threatens to do is that there's a divorce sometimes between how we're feeling inside and how our body responds to it. And I think practicing you know um, that, that those moments of silence allows you to be more you know attuned to what's going on in your um, in your in your body. Um, as, as well. And so I think that can be a really helpful um, exercise. And in the lives of families that are that are prayerful and faithful, I think um, you know our, our, our practices, our Catholic faith offers many opportunities for just reflective moments of, of pause um, in our day. And I think with the evidence is bearing that out that that's helpful for our kids. So there's a parent listening whose child daily gets stuck in anxiety. What is something that parent can do in that moment if the child is feeling anxiety, to try to help them through it. So, for the parent who is um, whose child might be um, really struggling in the moment, um, one of the primary things um, that I'd offer for them to do is um, to have their child um, kind of reconnect with themselves in their in their body in the moment. So often, as we talked about with anxiety, um, kids can uh, their their brain is either magnifying. Um, a, a, a real problem or a real frustration into something that's you know bigger um, than they feel that they can uh, they can manage, or it's maybe misperceiving something as a as a threat or a danger um, to them. And so um, often having a child um, kind of be back in their in their body in a physical sense. So maybe having them put their hand on their belly or on their chest to feel themselves breathe, breathing um, in and out um, uh, in a slow in a slow manner, or um, or having um, children drink um, you know kind of a carbonated um, beverage or um, or putting an ice cube in your in your mouth um, and just having them hold it for a second. And so while these things might sound you know um, like silly, the good thing is they're super easy um, to do. And I think it takes the brain from this really charged um, state to to being more aware of their child's kind of body sensations and can be a first step in helping them to to re-regulate um, and to calm their bodies. And finally, Larry, besides coping cat, what other resources might you recommend for parents? Sure. Um, so when it comes to um, when it comes to good resources for uh, managing anxiety, um, the um, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry has some great resources for at least understanding the language of um, of worry and um, and also recommending some resources if people are looking for a particular psychiatrist therapist um, in their neck of the woods that they feel they might need to um, connect with. The other is um, never neglect the pediatrician, family physician who really knows your child. Um, best. And often I think they're the greatest kind of springboard to um, connecting you to what the local resources might uh, might be. Um, you know, I maintain a, a YouTube channel as well to um, give parents kind of education on, you know, understanding different disorders and, and talking about different tips and tricks and techniques too that, that families can avail themselves of. Um, and on my website, I have a, a library um, of books that, that are tailored to um, specific, you know, anxiety needs like, you know, fear of going to bed, or or um, or panic attacks or things like that. Larry, thanks for teaching us about how children can overcome suffering related to anxiety and to develop healthier thought patterns. You've been great. Thank you. I appreciate it, Tom. Um, thank you for having me. And we thank our viewers for watching this episode of Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family, brought to you by Shalom World TV and the Catholic Medical Association, where we are inspiring physicians to imitate Jesus Christ. Please join us for our next episode and share the good news of vital signs with a friend. And may God bless you. I encourage everyone to send us emails with questions that you want to ask medical experts. Please email us at vitalsigns at shalomworld.org. Your questions and comments will help us determine what topics we'll cover in the next season of Vital Signs.
the viewers of Shalom TV throughout the world, I want to encourage you not only to support this amazing media apostolate, but to spread the word to others. We all know how the internet and mass media are polluting the world with the poison of pornography and so much other forms of materialism. This is the source of eternal life, the gospel, and Shalom TV is consecrated to spreading the word of Christ. Thank you.